Uh, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. We have Brandon Moss and Jacob Stoley. Brandon Moss is a professional engineer at Parametrics with the Pacific Northwest Water Markets. He provides hydraulic, mechanical, and civil engineering design, modeling, simulation, and field assessment support to local agency, industrial, and tribal clients. His work supports water, wastewater, projects including rehab rehabilitation and replacements of force mains and pump stations, treatments, processes, and hydraulic designs and reclamation, uh, reclamation plant upgrades. Jacob Stoley is an engineer in training at Parametrics within the Pacific Northwest water markets. He provides support for mechanical engineering design, modeling, simulations, and field assessment support to local agencies and industrial clients. His work includes pump stations, treatment processes, and facility redesigns for both water and wastewater systems. Please welcome, welcome Brandon and Jacob. Thank you, everyone. Um, we get jam packed this presentation with a lot of stuff, so uh, let's just get right into it here. If you were diligent and read our abstract, um, one of the things that we talked about at the very beginning of the abstract is just how CFD, I think, is often looked at something that is you know, almost always in the research space. It's usually super, super technical, really, maybe really expensive, takes a lot of time. Um, but over the years, technology has improved. There are now a lot of different softwares and codes, and this is becoming something that is now, I think, being more accepted in the industry, coming down to the level of just the engineers that can do this work. So really excited to show you how we're using CFD on a whole bunch of projects. Um, and with that, um, just general overview, um, Jacob's going to give you an overview of the CFD in general, kind of get everyone on the same page. Um, we'll show you some of the benefits that we're seeing in our projects and kind of tie each of those benefits to a specific case study, a specific project that we've used this on. And um, then also, of course, cost conscious, show you about um, kind of the costs that are involved in this. So, Jacob. Uh, thanks, Brandon. Uh, so basic overview of CFD, uh, just kind of get everybody on the same page, uh, same page is that uh, CFD stands for computational uh, fluid dynamics, uh, which I think is even a fancier way to say like fluid interacting with geometry as well as other fluids. Um, it's kind of a blanket term for both 2D and 3D simulation. Um, Parametrics is currently using a volume of fluid version, uh, which tracks shape and position as well as calculates Navier-Stokes separately. And then uh, the program brings them together and combines them to the model. Uh, there are several commercial softwares around. Uh, this is just a small list that I found. Uh, Autodesk CFD is uh, worth mentioning because it's integrated into Autodesk. Um, so that's kind of cool. Uh, Console, I have some personal experience with. I used it in uh, college. It's a multi-physics engine that uh, also does fluids, but it does quite a bit of other things. And honestly, it's quite a bit more academic. Uh, open foam is worth mentioning because it's open source. Um, so if anybody's feeling particularly motivated, you can actually download it for free after this, uh, just, just online. Parametrics uses Flow 3D though. And specifically we use Flow 3D Hydro. Uh, we use this for its workflow through civil and mechanical uh, projects. Uh, we also use it because of its large scale. Um, it covers both 2D and 3D simulations. And uh, honestly, they have a great uh, support team and offer training. So it seemed kind of the easiest solution to get started. Uh, defining a model, we're once again talking about overview. Uh, the most important thing is desired information, uh, which seems kind of obvious, but uh, desired information kind of really tells us which turbulence model we're going to use as well as the active physics engines. Uh, you can see all the physics engines there on the right. Uh, we've, we've used several of these, but uh, not even close to all of them. <laughs> uh, defining a model, we're also talking about geometry, scale, mesh density, boundary conditions, uh, initial conditions like fluid height and flow rates coming in and out, uh, and time. Time is most important uh, when determining steady state. Uh, as well as unsteady state, we can actually introduce uh, new flows and new variables uh, as time goes on into the model and achieve a completely different steady state. Uh, 
And the kind of unspoken thing is uh, more complexity leads to more computing time. And so therefore, uh, you know, all the project managers in the crowd, more computing time means longer schedules. And, and I think that's worth noting in CFD is, uh, you know, computationally, like we're still, we're still limited by the computer. Uh, so throughout this presentation, we're actually gonna go through uh, several of these. Uh, we have a, a case for each. Uh, we have an example project for each one of these. Uh, so uh, this slide will come back up uh, along with the uh, project. So to start us off, Brandon's gonna talk about the first couple. All right, we're gonna fly through these hopefully here. Um, now that you're all experts on CFD, Jake gave you a great background. Um, but first one here, we wanna talk about how um, we use CFD to help um, one of our clients actually in the audience here, um, look at justifying some of the construction costs for a particular project. So um, this is the Sandy Pump Station. It's in here, uh, Northeast Portland. Um, it's a flood management, flood control pump station. And really the purpose of this project is we wanted to look at providing some modifications to the wet well of this pump station um, that was built back in the 1940s. Um, just because the pumps have been upgraded and upsized over time, but the wet well has stayed the same shape and configuration. So if you look at like hydraulic institute standards, it's not going to align with what should really be there. Um, the operators have also noted when they've been out there hearing things sound like cavitation, they were concerned about you know, the longevity of the pump and the operation. So um, kind of give you an overview of how this works. Pump station there on the right side in the four bay goes across the levee. There's a siphon breaker here, um, just when the pumps turn off, so it doesn't siphon between both sides. And then discharges, um, says the Columbia River, it's just the Columbia Slough, which is immediately upstream of the Columbia River. And two discharge pipes, two pumps in this pump station that um, you know, drain all of the stormwater into um, kind of downstream of the levee. And there's a lot of technical information here. These are from the 1940 record drawings, um, but I'll kind of break it down for you here. Essentially, there's a wet well. Uh, two pumps at the pump station flow comes in here from the right side and actually when it was built back in the 1940s there were um, a variety of elements that were actually included um, baffles as well as a platform to try and prevent things like floor vortices wall vortices air coming in from the top into the pump really trying to prevent air from getting into this pump and uh, trying to prevent cavitation so in in brown here is where this uh, old cavitation platform is and if we look at a Horizontal view, you can see the cavitation there, platform again in brown. They also had some baffles in here, um, two of them that were uh, kind of immediately under the pump. Again, if we look at another cross section, those two baffles immediately below each pump and a couple more that were attached to this um, platform. So back when it was built, they were already thinking about some of these things, but over time, some of these components, you know, they've aged, they've gone probably well past their life um, with this station being over 80 years old. Um, and some of these have fallen off. So ultimately what we looked at was making sure all these were removed and designing some new features. We say, okay, well, what are the features gonna be and how much benefit are we really going to see from them? So we can actually get in and you know, build this model on the left side. We built a kind of larger scale model here. It goes about 150 feet in front of the pump station. We're essentially trying to understand the inlet conditions to the pump station from all the fluid out in the forebay. And then we have a smaller scale, well, a, a smaller model, but actually has um, potentially more computation because as Jacob was talking about, there's different types of um, physics engines and things we can use. In this case, we use what's called a large eddy simulation, which is looking at the um, specific rotation of fluid within all these um, cells and within the model. And we went through a whole bunch of iterations. I don't have enough time to go through all the different components that we kind of iterated through, but um, kind of landed on a variety of things. If you're familiar with Hydraulic Institute standards, you're probably familiar with floor cones and baffles and um, uh, fillets along the side and along the middle, trying to prevent um, vortices that can you know, go between the pumps and, and a whole bunch of places. One of the things we actually also did um, was we brought in the back wall a bit too. Um, as you can see, kind of the gray slant there, there's a whole section of the wall that we brought in too close to the pumps to align with HI. And of course, we can look at a whole bunch of different um, aspects when you have all this data from this model. Just wanna look at a couple of them. One of them is streamlines. This is actually um, specifically called out in Hydraulic Institute standards for um, small scale modeling. Um, HI does not actually have a standard for CFD, so it's kind of used as a surrogate for 
a CFD and the small scale models. And really we can see that um, with all these kind of components that we've added, we've really tried to straighten out the flow and get it to come in into both of these pumps, um, very straightened. And then um, if you look at a kind of a closer up view of the pumps on the left without modifications, there was quite a bit of swirl that was happening um, as was coming into the pump inlet, but on the right side, we have a floor cone and kind of bring everything into alignment. All the flow is coming in very perpendicular um, to the pump inlet. Uh, which you know is really going to significantly uh, benefit the performance. As I'm talking about rotation, another item we can look at is swirl angle, essentially how much rotation is happening in the fluid. Um, in this case, this is at different um, points within the pump column. And on the left, without modifications, anything that's like a light color, red, yellow, orange, is above a swirl angle of five degrees. And if you look at HI, um, anything above that is usually something you're trying to mitigate and avoid. So with the modifications that we propose, you know, we've eliminated um, almost all of it um, really in both pumps. There's still a little bit, but we kind of knew from the beginning that it was going to be hard to completely mitigate everything with kind of the station we're working with. So um, uh, this actually ended up, you know, has been built. You can see how some of these are fabricated here. Um, thought some of these might be interested for you to see. Um, the floor cone as well, right beneath the pump. And uh, they went out and removed the bar screen, took away the decking, and they used divers to go out and install all of this. So they did this without dewatering. Um, and when they did this with divers, they sent us some awesome pictures of what it looks like in the wet well. Um, there was actually you know, useful information in there, but um, really I think the thing that was cool about this and um, was important is that you're kind of trying to determine, you know, if you're going to go build some of this stuff, um, you know, what benefit are all of these actually going to provide? And a number of other criteria that we looked at, um, but uh, don't have enough time to go over all of them, but really provided significant benefit to say, yeah, you know, we're probably justified in installing these components and spending that money. Second um, case study here, uh, switching gears to using CFD is really the tool where there are not many other softwares or tools that we think could do something like this. Um, this project is in King County for the Interbay pump station, a very large 130, 160 MGD pump station just north of downtown Seattle. The overall arching, like part of this project is to rehabilitate and replace some of the twin force mains that are here, but these force mains discharge into a force main discharge structure at the top of the screen there, the FMDS which goes into a very large 96 inch gravity sewer, um, East Bay Interceptor 8. And one of the concerns was with this project, they were, they were currently limited to 130 MGD and they were gonna go up to 160 MGD from all these improvements. And the concern was this increased flow um, as well as the fact that this interceptor connects to the downstream North Junction, which is even bigger pipe, it's like 11 and a half feet. Um, during storm conditions, when that interceptor is basically full, your EVI-8, this 96 inch gravity pipe is also full. So if you have pumping that's going on either startup or if you have a pump shutdown from a power failure and a restart on emergency power, what is the surge in that pipe? And it's important because on the left side, you can see these uh, maintenance hole lids are basically flush with the top of this pipe. And so there was concern that these, if there was a surge condition in this pipe, it was going to pop these off and you're gonna have sewage spilling everywhere. So they didn't want that to happen. Um, so we kind of uh, did a couple things here on the left is interbay pump station and really um, the force mains pump into each of these maintenance hole structures that are all along that 96 inch pipe into the uh, North interceptor. We did some Manning's calcs on the whole thing. And as you'll see in some data here coming up in a minute, um, the maintenance calcs already suggested that there were gonna be some issues with the HGL being above the rim elevation. But we also wanted to look at specifically these first four structures because they are basically flush as you get further down, the pipe sloping down and you have much more cover later on. So in this case, we limited our CFD modeling to the first four structures. The main thing to pay attention to here is kind of the center, um, those center structures, but um, we fictitiously added stand pipes on these and within the model, we're able to actually calculate what that surge height is based on startup. So now we're kind of reached a steady state and you'll see this is going to um, basically power off like in a power outage situation. And then it's going to kick one pump on here and then it's going to kick the second pump on. 
And you see right in the middle, you see some surge that's kind of happening in some of those places. Um, and we could look at this data um, a little more closely. The four structures we're concerned about, we have the Manning's HGL that we calculated based on our downstream conditions and all the pipe flow and whatnot. CFD gives us a maximum HGL from startup. And then we also kind of ran it to essentially a steady state, let it, let it run long enough um, to where you don't have that kind of startup surge. We can compare this with our rim elevation of the structures. And what we're looking at then is what's the headspace or you know, is there any space available between the predicted HGL and the rim elevation? Here you can see Manning's was already predicting at a 106 and 107, these structures that there was already gonna be some issues with overtopping, whoops. Uh, but in the startup condition, we actually saw quite a bit more, a little bit about three feet, a little more than that. Um, and then as this ran to steady state, it got much closer back to what kind of a Manning steady state um, result would be. You can see 107 um, and 105 are pretty close to you know, about the same HGL. So it basically just made us more confident that um, we could pick something that's a bit more conservative. In this case, we chose to like add stand pipes that were a few feet tall, um, basically increased with risers these, um, these lids to, to try and prevent a potential surge condition that would have sewage spilling everywhere. And there are really not many other surge types of software that can do gravity type flow. Many of them do um, closed pipe, full pipe flow surge, but doing gravity pipe flow surge um, that I'm aware of, there are no softwares that do that or maybe very little, CFD being one of them. So we thought this was a great application. Third uh, case here, um, Looking into if you kind of have a design concept that you have in mind, you say, is this actually going to work? Um, this is a case where we use CFD for that. So Cascade Water Alliance to the east of Tacoma here. Uh, the project purpose for CFD specifically was to try and see if the proposed design alternative was actually going to meet the objective and function how it should. Overview of how this system works. Um, on the right side is Lake Taps. There's an inlet structure into um, kind of a main pipe that goes uh, down to this four bay gatehouse. It splits into three pen stocks here and the pen stocks go all the way down to a powerhouse. There's no power actually being generated here, but Cascade Water Alliance still maintains all the flow through here because they're maintaining the level in Lake Taps. Um, and this actually also splits off uh, some bypass to go to a fourth pen stock. And here's the powerhouse and these, all these pen stocks come through and they come into this plunge pool. Um, kind of the long rectangular, I'll show you a picture in a second here, um, and then spills out into the downstream conveyance. Normally, if they were generating power, it would be coming through the penstocks in through the power generators, and it comes down and out um, into this plunge pool. And what that looks like here, um, you're looking at this uh, penstock um, discharge at the very top. The issue they were having is that really peak flows, they have pretty significant amount of flow that is spilling out of this plunge pool. And at one point they did have um, this kind of shield barrier to prevent some of this flow getting out, um, but that reached kind of the end of its useful life. And they were actually having issues of um, some of these pieces breaking off. So they ended up removing it. And you can see that video on the right there is um, a pretty intense amount of flow. I think it's like, three to 400 CFS, something like that. It's a huge amount of flow. Um, and so we had a structural engineer who came up with what I thought was like a really cool idea um, that we um, named the half pipe solution, which was basically putting a half pipe on top of this penstock um, discharge. And it spanned all the way across that plunge pool to essentially try and keep all the fluid coming out of there angled down and into the plunge pool. But we were able to put this into CFD and actually look at, um, oh, the top one isn't playing. Well. Any case, the top one looks pretty much just like the video you saw. There was a lot more splashing, but with this half pipe solution on the bottom, um, what we still found is while it contained it pretty well, you'll see towards the end of the video, there were situations where there was still fluid that was coming out of this plunge pool. And ultimately we decided that the solution of the half pipe was probably not going to fully meet the objective. Uh, you know, the project containing it. And with CFD, you can put in all sorts of stuff if you want to just change your geometry and press play again. We put in a little cover here because they actually used to historically even have a cover over this, although they don't like the covers because it limits lighting and maintenance is a little difficult to get down there. Just, you know, a variety of ideas you can, you can um, 
put in a CFD and run through you know, different scenarios. So it's very valuable for trying to determine you know, if, if the solution was even going to work when it was a great idea, but um, ultimately had to go a different direction and this is still in design. And the fourth one for me, and I'll stop talking and then you can listen to Jacob. Um, this is a project where we found CFD to actually both um, you know, help um, in terms of reducing permitting impacts, but also significantly decrease the potential project construction costs. Um, we're back with our favorite friends, Multnomah County Drainage District, another flood control pump station here in um, North Portland. The initial objective of this or purpose of this project was to rehabilitate some discharge lines that were aging. Um, but actually, I didn't put this on here, but um, there was also a bit of erosion that was happening on the bank of this levee, it was in front of the core levee, so nothing was actually impacting the core levee yet. But um, the idea was also to go put some material there to try and reinforce the levee to make sure that continuing erosion didn't happen. Um, well, why was a road? Oh, sorry, I guess it's same thing here. Uh, flood control pump station, pump station discharge lines, uh, lines and discharge into the um, Columbia Slough that lead to the Columbia River. Um, why was erosion happening? Well, when we thought we had to go put some material out here and uh, you know, kind of do some of these project activities, we did a survey, including a bathymetric survey. And uh, right at the discharge of the pipes, you can see there was a pretty significant scour hole that has formed over a lot of years, which was of course leading to why the scour was happening in the first place. So once this was identified, the project changed a little bit from just a pipe kind of repair project to um, you know, what can we do to remedy this scour hole? Um, and as we found out in conversation with permitting agencies, there was a concern about putting things like riprap and concrete because this is a designated salmon habitat. And if you have to do those sorts of uh, construction, use those construction materials, you either need to do a variety of permit mitigation, um, which can be very costly. And if you need to have material that you have to compact, you'd have to dewater this entire area to do that. So we get very expensive to do this type of um, project. Um, so we initially proposed, well, what if we put kind of like an energy dissipator on the end? And this was our very first concept, even kind of as we're talking to permitting people and realizing we'd have to support this with the yeah, riprap and different materials that the permitting agencies uh, didn't necessarily want to see. I also realized that um, there's like no information on how to actually design these anywhere. Um, there are some manuals. Um, I think the Federal Highway Administration has some on like culvert energy dissipation and whatnot, but there are very few that I could find about how to design an energy dissipator with these sort of orifices all over. Um, some information out there, but when I followed essentially these design guidelines, um, or I guess very briefly that how I got to designing them. Um, we were also trying to make sure that we didn't cause any more erosion. Um, I believe this is called the Holstrom curve. I pronounced that right. Essentially, it's uh, looking at if particles are transported, deposited, or um, eroded based on the velocity of, in this case, like a river and particle size. So we're in the slough, we have mostly silt sand. The velocity at which something is gonna be eroded and transported is around 0.65 feet per second. So if you follow this manual and say, you know, at the fluid coming out of each of my orifices, if I want it to be limited to that flow, so I'm not impacting anything, um, what would the size of this structure be? You can do all the calcs here and you say, you know, for every orifice, it gets down to that flow, this thing was gonna be over 160 feet long. And if you wanted to add a factor of safety, half a foot per second or something was gonna be over 200 feet long, it'd be very difficult to construct. And again, if you're trying to support this and dewater this whole area, it would be um, a really, <laughs> impressive uh, construction project. So we brought CFD in to try and optimize this energy dissipator. And I'm sure Jacob got tired of me just calling him up with a huge grin on my face, like, you ready to make another one of these designs for me um, to put into the CFD? So we see a, a bunch of different ones here and kind of what we are, are still refining, but are almost at um, kind of the stage we're about done with this is what we're looking at is a result from CFD modeling. Um, and each of the cells that we're coloring here, essentially we've left off any cells that are less than 0.5 feet per second. And you're only seeing things that a fluid that has a velocity of 0.5 feet per second or higher. Um, and we're trying to just look at and see is any of that fluid basically in contact with the um, interface but, you know, between the, with, the, uh, with the slew. And really you're seeing that most of this is you know, really just outside of that um, 
kind of interface. We're not seeing that many. There's a little circle on the right there. Um, still some optimization happening, but trying to figure out how you can design something as a reasonable size, use CFD to help um, you know, try and find a method that can reduce the permitting impact of certain materials. So we're not actually using um, any exposed riprap or concrete structures. We're looking to install this via uh, supported via um, helical tiles and then um, like native materials. So it, you know, it's great for um, salmon species and whatnot. So really um, CFD became a very, very important tool. I don't know how we would have designed an energy dissipator like this without it being way oversized or having to pay for significant permitting mitigations and kind of all the sort dewatering and whatnot. Jacob, I'll leave it next to you. Uh, thanks, Brandon. Uh, next, we're gonna show how CFD can support design details of other disciplines. Um, this project is called Upper Buckley. Uh, it's one of my favorite projects, probably because it was my first CFD project. Uh, but it's also one of my favorites because it was a much larger transportation and stormwater design project. Uh, our extent of CFD was this manhole. <laughs> uh, and I, I kind of really appreciated how small our scale was versus the entire scale of the uh, project. Um, so our first task was to look at the existing system. Uh, second slide. Oh, perfect. Uh, so you can see uh, we set the flow back in the pipe uh, for the 100 year flow uh, in order to simulate gravity flow. Uh, you're actually about to see a, a kickback into that gravity flow as well. Uh, yep, and then the bigger one. Yep, all right. And then basically the manhole uh, completely overtops. Uh, the only reason it doesn't is because our simulation actually ended there. So all that fluid that went up actually got deleted. Uh, the simulation just kind of uh, forgets about it. Uh, so not a great sign either, we're uh, losing fluid. Um, another item you can see is in their existing system, uh, 40 feet per second uh, in, that, in that center column, uh, also not ideal. Uh, so basically we use this video uh, to show the client, and I think the client also used this video to show um, their constituents as well as maybe a couple of council meetings uh, that the improvements were needed. So the solution was a 10 foot diameter sea camp file manhole. Uh, that is 45 feet deep, uh, just, just an absolute beast of a structure. Um, and, and really we confirmed that the stormwater would not overtop this new structure. Uh, we also ran it with air entrainment, uh, which I do not have video for, but it, air entrainment also significantly uh, affects the outgoing flow as well as uh, the overall storage of this manhole. Um, you can also see uh, at the, yeah. You can see a little eight inch vent there. Uh, that was the existing manhole uh, that the client basically re repurposed as a vent. Um, and as I said before, this, this project is a good example of how we support other disciplines. Uh, first discipline would be structural. Uh, there's obviously a lot of falling water in here. Uh, we had uh, the model allowed us to basically show where uh, reinforcement may be required, where the water was hitting it. Um, as well as the uh, V-shaped uh, geometry at the bottom in order to uh, uh, convey flow into the pipe. Uh, yeah, so we were able to show them where reinforcement might, re might be required. And we were also able to show them uh, the forces required, uh, how, you know, how hard was the water hitting it. Uh, at the end of the day, they did not uh, choose any local reinforcement, but uh, it was talked about. And I think if we couldn't have provided them answers, uh, they would have designed it. Um, another support, uh, we supported mechanical. Uh, as you can see in the upper right there, uh, the fluid coming out of the secant pile manhole uh, is getting close to 25 feet per second. Uh, and we were reusing existing pipes. Uh, this could uh, cause severe erosion. And so, I'm not sure how else we would have known how quickly that that flow would have been leaving that pipe uh, and and for how how far it traveled down the pipe. So the solution was to put a uh, steel uh, encasing, I'm sorry, a steel sleeve uh, for the next uh, couple of feet in order to reduce that erosion. And you can see where the velocity uh, actually slows down throughout the pipe. Uh, last, we also looked at uh, uh, helped mechanical again. Uh, air entrainment was a big problem on this. 
uh, the client actually wanted to get rid of the eight inch vent. Uh, and by showing them this video, as well as a couple others, uh, we discussed how the vent was necessary. Uh, those velocities would be much higher without the vent, as well as uh, quite a bit more uh, capacity of the secant file manhole would be required without the vent. Uh, lastly, help with trouble uh, troubleshooting during startup. Uh, CFD was used in a lot process improvement uh, for the Lot Clean Water Alliance. Um, this is their newly constructed treatment train five. I believe this picture; these pictures are in uh, swing cell two A and two B. Uh, and as you can see, there's coarse bubble diffusion and fine bubble diffusion. Uh, and also, as you can see, these rooms are huge. Uh, so in some regards, geometry was not a huge problem here, uh, just a big box, but the scale of it uh, was, was quite impressive. Uh, we did not actually model the fine bubble or uh, coarse bubble diffusers. We modeled them with mass momentum sources. And so we basically set up all these, moment, these uh, momentum sources pushing air up into the fluid. So this is a little hard to see. Uh, especially because of the low, uh, low frame rate. Uh, but top left, uh, a lot of streamlines, uh, difficult to tell. The, the issue is that the client thought that there could be flow moving backwards throughout the treatment train. And so uh, we created the figure on the right, basically showing flow direction at the weir height uh, in order to prove that flow wasn't moving backwards uh, in their design conditions. And this kind of solved a few things. They, they thought that maybe they would have to move their nitrogen sensor. Uh, they thought maybe that uh, mixing wasn't sufficient. Uh, they, they thought maybe, you know, the baffle wall kind of needed to move. Uh, all these ideas were thrown around. Basically, we just confirmed the design conditions. Uh, we also ran a separate model uh, that has the door open, uh, which you can You can kind of see that the door is open there. Uh, we believe that when they ran startup, uh, the door was actually open because by that little change in the ge geometry, you could see the flow moving backwards um, and actually causing quite a bit of backward flow, uh, several CFS. Uh, final thing I want to show is the air entrainment. Uh, you can actually see the uh, fine bubble diffuser diffusion on the left, and then you can see the uh, coarse bubble diffusion on the right. Uh, Really, I think this is just cool. This is by far one of our longest models, uh, most computationally intensive model, uh, just because of its size and because of the, uh, the air mass momentum sources. Uh, next, uh, Brandon to talk about costs. Yes, I'm sure. I think everyone, um, so I mean, it's in our title here, um, is interested in how much of these things actually cost. I mean, you can probably go and look most of these up. These are all generally public information. Um, for the most part, we've found that it doesn't always have to be a huge cost to do some of these. Um, I mean, one of the outliers may be uh, the first project, Sandy Pump Station, but that was, it was in, in terms of percentage, a large percentage, because that was pretty much the whole project was CFD. And then um, we had some structural design for some of those modifications, was pretty much it. Um, but most of these other projects on any, you know, decent sized project, it really is only a few percent of the overall budget, talking 10 to 20K in total. Um, and really we just feel like this, this software can be a really cost effective tool. It's not the only tool we use. There's other softwares, spreadsheets, all sorts of things you probably have that you're using to do all of your design, but it's just another tool in the tool belt that um, I don't think is as, <laughs> as expensive or as um, out there as people might think. Um, so we've, we've seen some great benefits um, on, on all these projects. I suppose some of the downsides might be that if you're trying to start up a CFD practice, if you're a consultant, um, you need to have 3D modeling already established. It's pretty common at parametrics. So we do all of our designs in 3D. So we already have all that stuff ready to go. And then of course you might need to purchase CFD software, which can be expensive depending on what vendor, um, Jacob did mention there are some open source ones you could get started on. Their interface is a little uh, left to be desired, but there are some companies that make interfaces for those open softwares at a, at a lower cost. So, um, I mean, to start up, you could easily be looking at 50 to 100K for a software, um, CFD software, um, with any one of the vendors. 
so with that, um, that's the end of our presentation and we'll take some questions. All right, just to remind everybody, we are live streaming. So if you have a question, we ask that you um, ask it in the microphone. Do we have any questions out there? I, I guess I was curious, the, um, the scour, the scour hole in the slew, was that, what, how was that noticed as it being an issue or what was the issue with happening? How was it, it was noticed? Is that what you're, how was noticed your question? Yeah. Um, I mean, so we thought we were going to have to put some material there to reinforce the kind of the, it's a bank in front of the core levy um, to reinforce that to just prevent the scour. But to do that, we thought we need some design drawings. So we did a survey and a bathymetric survey, and it was revealed in the bathymetric survey that there was a scour hole there. So that, that was what ended up kind of triggering some of those things and discussions with the permitting people and also MCDD just being a very active steward and trying to always do the right thing for you know the environment or in this case um, you know trying to reduce when these pumps kick on and create scour and turbidity you know for habitat and whatnot um, you know something that's ultimately being done now to prevent that any other questions What kind of a computer environment do you have? Like cloud computing or you have desktop application or cluster? We use both. Um, we have a cloud computer on Azure. Um, it's a 32 core um, cloud computer. And then we also just have some local computers that we use for just doing like the post-processing and developing videos and figures and stuff like that. And there is a cost for the, you know, having a cloud computer. A um, few hundred dollars a month, right? Usually. And if you're interested in doing things that are even more um, intensive, I mean, you can buy cloud computing time as, as well. You can put this on a computer that has thousands of cores, tens of thousands of cores. Like that. Any more questions out there? I'm wondering if there's any situations you ran into where you wanted to take it from CFD modeling to physical modeling, like you ran into something you said, I, I don't know if this model is predicting it right or anything like that. It's definitely something um, we have thought about um, and we are thinking about for future projects. We would like to do both the CFD and the scale modeling. Um, I mean, scale modeling can be pretty expensive. Um, so this is sometimes a surrogate for if you can't quite get to the scale modeling level, you at least have software that, you know, at, at a reduced cost to try and give yourself something to go off of. But we're, we're definitely actively looking into how to incorporate scale modeling with some of these projects. All right, thank you. That's all the